Hello there. Hi. This is the story of an American dream. Good to see you again. It's nice to be here. We were just driving by, so we thought we'd drop in and say hello. It was a dream of happy families on wheels. Hey, how do you like our new car? The Ford Motor Company brought it from Detroit to Dagenham, then sold it to Britain. I'd sure like to shake hands with the man who designed it. Where is he? Well, right now, he's working on a dream car for you folks. A dream car? Wow, is it going to look like a rocket? From the 1950s onwards, Ford revolutionized the cars we drove. They produced dream cars for the average British family. The Angler was, to me, the epitome of style because of the, the grace of the cut on it. In the 60s and 70s, Ford sold dreams to boy racers, too. When the Capri came out, you just looked at it and you go, my God, that is just, I haven't seen a car like that before. You know, not one that I could afford. That was the power with Ford. They would, they would offer a dream that was accessible. But this dream came at a price. The mass production of motor cars required an army of assembly line workers who did jobs that were infamous for their soul-destroying monotony. What you do, little tricks, I would have imaginary football matches where I might be playing, winning the FA Cup or designing something in the head. Anything just to get yourself out of it. At its peak, Dagenham was producing more than 3,000 cars every day. Its most popular dream car of all time, the Cortina, sold around 5 million in Britain alone. But the assembly line workers had a love-hate relationship with the cars they made. And for some, the dream became a nightmare. This is the story of the rise and fall of Ford's Dagenham dream. The great invention of Henry Ford was the moving assembly line, which mass-produced the Model T. It would turn the Detroit-based Ford Motor Company into a global power and transform the car industry. As part of Ford's worldwide expansion, they opened a giant factory in Dagenham in 1931. Offering jobs to 30,000 workers, Dagenham was the biggest factory in Europe, and it breathed new life and hope into an economy crippled by depression. Promotional films made by the Ford Film Unit gave expression to the dream of putting Britain on wheels and selling a Ford car to every family. This included their own car workers, who from the beginning were paid above average wages in the hope that car and home ownership would encourage work discipline and loyalty. They were all part of what the company called the Ford family. In the hungry 30s, Ford soon brought new prosperity to Dagenham. One of my mates, his father was out of work and he got a job there and his money was half a crown an hour. Unheard of, unheard of, it's half a crown an hour. he become sort of the millionaire of the, the street. Dagenham, built on the Thames marshes east of London, became a boom town. Everyone wanted to work at Ford's, including schoolboy Harry Coleman. They wanted uh, a tea boy, and the man who lived next door to me was a blacksmith, and he got a job as a blacksmith. And uh, he said to my mum, how old is your boy? And my mum said, oh, 13. She said, oh, he said, pity. He said, because we want a tea boy, he said, and uh, I could have took him down there if he'd have been 14. My mum said, he is 14. <laughs> he is 14. And with that, the next day I'm down at Ford's making a, pot, a bucket full of tea for the men. Harry entered the new time and motion world of the moving assembly line. The worker was a small cog in a giant machine. Production was broken down into repetitive time jobs and the pace of work was kept up by foremen. You had to be a, a big man to be a foreman. The simple reason is you had, you had the discipline. That's why they always picked these big people. Because when he said, I want you to do that, you know, either speed up or something like that, if you're talking to a big bloke, you think twice and you know, oh, all right, I'll do it. But if you're a little bloke, you <laughs> tell him to sod off. During the Second World War, there was a new spirit of unity, with Dagenham playing a heroic role in the war production drive. 
Britain's workers, like Britain's factories, have switched over from peace to war to protect the things of peace. And if carrying on with a job and keeping up the output of war materials is going to bring us nearer that next big switch over, the switch over to peace, then watch our smoke. Ford supplied the British Army with around a quarter of a million military vehicles and trucks, along with 130,000 Fords and tractors that helped feed the nation at war. The war seemed to prove Ford's loyalty and value to Britain. Suspicion of its American ownership turned to admiration, and in 1948, Ford cashed in by introducing a revolutionary idea to Dagenham. This is where a new idea moved in. At Ford of Dagenham, all plans for car production were recast in 1948, and a new criterion of the road was set, five-star motoring. Ford's five-star motoring aimed to produce cars for the British market that were sleek, stylish and speedy. Scaled-down versions of American dream cars. They designed saloon cars as well as smaller cars like the New Anglia and Prefect. One of the Dagenham designers was Charles Thompson. We used to spend all day talking about cars, sketching and drawing and getting paid for it. It seemed, and I know this is only an exaggeration, it seemed that we used to sketch and draw all day long until somebody said, stop, we'll make that type of thing. Everything you drew after a while, uh, if your chief liked what you were doing, was translated into three dimensions. And this was clay modeling. Shaping a smooth line along the fender of the car, you would spend days and weeks just getting it to look right. Ford's Dagenham plant was geared up to produce the new models. It was to be a breakthrough in British car production. The starting point in the whole process was the Thames foundry, the largest foundry in Europe. Dennis O'Flynn began work there in 1953. My first day there, I thought was going to be my last day. Suddenly find myself walking in black sand, molten metal all over the blooming place, unbelievable noise. One of the jobs of the foundry men was casting the moulds for the car engines. This was one of the most dangerous jobs in the entire car making process. It was here, in these swelteringly hot conditions, that the Ford assembly line began. The length of the line and the speed of the line allowed the casting to get reasonably solid from the time it was cast. And then there was uh, what they called a shakeout. And there was two blokes there pulling the moles off. The sort of uh, system they had in the shakeout was so physically demanding and so hot that they could only work half an hour at a time. Same team, no extra men for that, but you had, they'd split up and they'd, they'd do half an hour on and half an hour off. Ford wanted to promote a reverential image of the new car making at Dagenham. So in 1953, they commissioned a symphony to celebrate their achievement. I don't know if any of you have ever visited a great engineering factory. It's quite an experience. I visited one recently and I was greatly impressed with the common purpose of those who work there. There seemed a striking parallel between their skill with the machines and the skill of musicians playing their instruments. But despite the orchestral metaphor of working together in perfect harmony, the reality of work on the assembly line proved to be very different. Henry Ford's regimented time and motion system for making cars alienated much of his workforce. If you wanted to go to the toilet, they told you when you could go to the toilet, not Mother Nature. Somebody would be standing there timing you. And if you were two, if you were three minutes, you know, the foreman would come up and say, you know, you've been away a long time, you know, put his arm around you and your cars were marked. You know, so there was that and there were occasions when you'd have a security bloke overhead on the balcony watching you, you know. Ford's orchestral film culminated in the gleaming cars rolling off the assembly line. This was the great reward for Ford car workers. Their families could buy one at a 20% discount. However, for some who worked on the assembly lines, the day-to-day -day pressures of making cars dented the dream of car ownership. 
If you work there, there's no glamour in it, I don't think, because you're seeing them all day long and working with them, you know, you, I don't think not the glamour out of it. I think I've got one and that's it. Uh, you don't go around patting it every half hour and dusting it. Well, I, most people didn't, anyhow. It's just a, a convenience. Nevertheless, for most people, it was a dream come true. Beautiful to look at, fast to move with. The nice affordable to dream of five-star motoring oh, paid off. Dream. Dream. By the late 50s, around one in every three cars sold in Britain was made at Dagenham. Ford were tuned into the aspirations of a new, younger generation, like Derek Forster. New Year's Day, 1957, that was when I became the proud owner of a Ford Prefect, and it was the deluxe version. I could have been driving a Cadillac for, for all, all I knew, and, and I was very fortunate because my parents had bought me that car uh, prior to my 17th birthday in, in the March. This was a time when car ownership was still a novelty that could set the curtains twitching. I parked at the front door. I would pretty much guarantee, if my memory serves me right, we were the only car on the street. So you can imagine, it was, um, you know, it made you feel good. Dream, 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 dream. The love affair between men and their proud new possession was blossoming in streets all over Britain. It was my pride and joy. I think I polished everything but the exhaust. Well, in fact, I think I polished that as well. The exhaust pipe, the engine, was cleaner than the outside. And the pulling power of a smart new car promised in adverts for Ford's five-star range seemed indisputable. It was certainly 17-year-old Derek's Ford Prefect, rather than him, that most impressed his first girlfriend, Sylvia. To my way of thinking, it was as big is any American Cadillac that I'd seen on the pictures, this sort of thing. I had no idea what it was, what type it was, but it was just beautiful. A new courtship ritual emerged in the 50s, a public display in which young couples showed off this very latest status symbol. To teenagers like Derek and Sylvia, their Ford Prefect was sex on wheels. I really expected that people walking past would be thinking, who is that in that car? And I mean, when I look in retrospect and see it in old family photographs where Derek is standing with his arm on the top of the car and his head and shoulders taller than that, how little it was. I didn't realise we possibly used a shoe horn to get inside. <laughs> Derek and Sylvia fell in love and became a couple. Every spare moment they had, they spent together in their Ford Prefect, often making for local beauty spots. But there was to be no hanky-panky in this courtship. If you drove five or six or maybe stretch it 10 miles, you'd gone some. So you used to identify the laybys in, 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 in a radius of about, you know, 10 miles. And, um, We'd go with a flask and perhaps a sandwich or a little cake or something like that uh, and sitting past the time in the car and if it had been raining and the car had got slightly mud splattered or whatever, I would drop Sylvia off at home, six o'clock-ish, half past six, drive home, put the car in the garage, wash the car, leather it off and then polish it so that it was gleaming as new as if it was in the showroom. My... Dare I admit this, priorities were to my Ford Prefect. It won the day every time. In 1962, a hit BBC police series inspired even more of the young generation to dream of driving Ford's new range of cars. The scriptwriters of Z Cars wanted their fictional cops to drive Ford Zephyrs and Zodiacs, imitating the real Lancashire constabulary. It was the first of many cop shows to use Ford cars, and it made a deep impression on young farmer's son, Edwin Tipper. I saw these lovely cars, um, very American looking, very glitzy, tail fins on, and um, lovely sounding engine. 
and I thought I'd got to get one of these some way or other to the farm and the only way to do it was of course uh, get the glossy brochure and keep it my poor old dad who at that time was running a Mark 1 Ford console. Edwin's pester power paid off and life on the farm would never be quite the same again. It was the beginning of a lifelong love affair with the family car, which he still drives to this day. On the farm, I hadn't got many luxury items in those days, and I think it was just a little bit to make my life light up. I think really that's why I really wanted one of these cars so desperately. Heartbeat, why do you miss when my baby kisses me? As a boy, Edwin was put in charge of looking after the car. He kept it spotless inside and out. But when the car first arrived, he was only 13. So his next mission was to persuade his dad to let him drive it. Dad was a bit reluctant. He was sort of um, very cautious over his vehicles, you might say, really. He spent a lot of money on it. But however, yes, I was fortunate enough to be allowed to have a drive around the yard and change the gears, first gear, second gear. I could even hit top just on the bit of concrete around the back there. Edwin spent four years practicing driving around the farmyard. So by the time he was 17 and took his test, he was quite an experienced driver. When I passed my test, great day. It meant that I could come home and I could get behind the wheel of the Zodiac. And my father was really a little bit reluctant, I think, to let me off alone with it, even though I'd looked after the thing for quite a few years already. So the first trip was to visit the grandparents down in the village and driving down the road, got the wheel, I was in charge, on my own, and absolutely magnificent. I, I really enjoyed that. After they married, Derek and Sylvia traded in their beloved prefect for the new Anglia, one of the next generation of small cars produced by Ford at Dagenham. The Anglia was, to me, the epitome of style because of the the grace of the cut on it. I mean, I had never known what style was in a vehicle. I mean, it was metal or four wheels that you drove. But impressed as I was with the prefect, the Anglia was just wow. I need love, love. Derek and Sylvia's love for their new Anglia grew as strong as it was for their prefect. Their car remained at the heart of their relationship. The only difference was there was now a new addition to the family. Well, Sylvia was sat in the car with the baby and looking after the baby. I'd jump out the car with a, with a wash leather or a, a polisher <laughs> and start polishing the vehicle. So the, the, the Anglia really followed on from the prefect and, and, and I think it would be fair to say it was looked after every bit as well. Yet despite the popularity of Ford's latest models like the new Anglia, the American-owned company still had an image problem. Their cars were perceived to be cheap, flashy, and unreliable compared to a truly British-made car. I always remember a neighbor of mine coming up to me one day when I'd bought my first car, which was a 100E Anglia, and saying, oh, you bought a Ford, one of those tin things. I mean, what do you mean, a tin thing? He says, yes, he walked up to the bonnet and bumped it up, and I said, it's made out of tin. And he just summarised the general feeling, you know, British cars were made out of steel, hand, handmade, whereas American cars were tinny, mass-produced things. To improve their image, Ford targeted one of the fastest-growing new spectator sports, motor racing, as a way to give even more glamour to their brand. By racing for Britain, Ford hoped to promote their national credentials and provide the ultimate guarantee of the performance of their cars. They teamed up with racing car specialist Lotus, and by the mid-60s, the Ford Lotus Formula One team had become a force to be reckoned with in motor racing. The man who masterminded the reinvention of Ford's image was public relations boss Walter Hayes. His next step was to move into saloon car rallying. In a male-dominated racing world, he realised the publicity value of signing up a pretty young woman, Anita Taylor, from a well-known racing family. I had a phone call from Ford, from the competitions manager at the time, and they invited me to go down to Dagenham to meet the boss. And that was Walter Hayes. 
at that time he was a director of Ford and he was very forward thinking. Anita won her first race driving for Ford and right from the start attracted much publicity. She was determined to prove that she could drive with as much skill and courage as any man. The first corner in any race is frightening. There's cars all around you and you want to get to the corner first. I love the feeling of speed, the satisfaction of doing a good lap against the men being getting fastest lap was exhilarating excitement and danger went hand in hand this was anita's first big crash i don't remember a great deal because it happened so quickly that everything was going wrong very quickly and i thought oh dear this is it i've had it came to a halt and couldn't believe that I was still, I thought, OK, I was feeling my legs, my arms. I felt fine. I was absolutely amazed that I hadn't been badly injured. The only thing that bothered me as a female was I didn't want my teeth knocking out or my face scarring. <laughs> Typical female. In the early 60s, Ford planned to develop the ultimate new family car to sell across Europe, and a race began between the design team at Dagenham and the rival Ford of Germany plant in Cologne. Dagenham beat off the competition, but before the car could be signed off, it needed final approval from American bosses in Detroit. We had got right to the end, everything was going fine, management in Britain had approved everything, and tooling had even started. And the tail lamps were what we used to refer to retrospectively as the Chinese eye variety, where the fluting down the side of the body turned round the corner of the back and went down in a slope and across the back and up again on the other side. But American management came over for the final signing off and told us that uh, the new fangled way of tail lamps in America, in the American cars, were the, what we used to refer to as dustbin tail lamps circular tail lamps and I was given the job to change the tail lamps to the circular one which you now see down there. The car was the Ford Cortina and now there was another race to get it off the production line. This began at the new foundry at Dagenham which was geared up for a huge production drive. But the work remained hazardous which meant accidents happened all the time. One young lad, he came to work with us pulled his flask in one night and it slipped off the roller and removed his finger and then whipped him down to the medical. That was a memorable night for me because about two hours before I had become a shop steward. So this was my first accident. When we got down to the medical, the, <laughs> the medical bloke said, have you got the finger? So we went back to try and find the finger and somebody said, oh, I saw so-and-so going down there with uh, get the finger, giving it to the cat. The grim humour of the men who endured these harsh working conditions turned to anger, however, when the management increased production targets and speeded up the assembly line. The speed of the conveyor in the new foundry was 18 foot a minute. And then one day, this very genial superintendent came up, you know, it had been somebody's favourite grandfather in appearance. And he, he said, from Monday night, he said, we'll be speeding up the conveyor belt to one, 21 feet a minute. And uh, I said, well, cautiously, frankly, because I wasn't sure how, how much support I'd be getting from the rest of the men, and I was a shop steward at the time. I said, get stuffed. Dennis had the full support of his fellow workers. So when the management refused to back down and insisted on the new line speed, they all started to go slow. We carried on for six weeks until eventually the company conceded, you know, they were not going to win this particular battle. They reverted to the 18 foot. That's when the company realized that they had not only lost the battle of the speed up, they'd lost the goodwill of at least 108 very good workers. One of the new bosses who would have to deal with some of these issues was about to arrive at Dagenham fresh-faced from university. 
Ian Gibson. And the first thing that struck me was you turn off the main road and you're in the Ford site and you kept on going down this road in the bus and you kept on going down in the road in the bus and you see a thing that says Dagenham Engine Plant. You get inside it and the offices are at the other end of it and you find yourself walking through a factory which at the time was the biggest factory I'd ever seen in my life. And it was a machining plant because they're making engines. So, so the air is full of that peculiar mixture of uh, machining fluid and, and fine metal grit. Walking down through this haze, and there's enough haze that you can't see the far end of the building that you're inside. And you begin to think, what am I going to do in a place like this? Uh, but at the same time, there's excitement because production processes and that many people working and machines going have a rhythm and a pace of their own that sort of enters the blood. The Cortina was a big hit, and in its first year, Ford sold a quarter of a million of them. The Dagenham plant worked round the clock to satisfy demand, a pressure that led to constant disputes over pay and conditions. The negotiations were a game that both management and unions always had to be seen to win. Shop steward Dennis O'Flynn's main adversary was American boss True Hayford. On one occasion, he and I had a confrontation over something. We had this eyeball to eyeball in every sense of the word, and he backed off, went down to his office. I followed him into his office. We finished our discussion there, came out the office, we started to walk down the corridor, and he came to his door and he shouted out after me, and let that be a clear understanding. I turned and ran back, kicked the door in, and went, Look, look, he said, for God's sake, allow me to save face somehow, will you? And that, that was it. He was a showman. <laughs> and, but you, you, you couldn't help but like the guy. The brash American cars of the 60s set the tone for the American managers at Dagenham. They brought a new style and pizzazz that made a deep impression on the young Ian Gibson, working his way up the Ford management ladder. Working for Ford in the UK was really carrying a bit of the US culture around with you. As a member of management, you normally called your bosses by their first name, and they normally called you by the first name. Uh, in that part of the 60s, in most of the UK, it was all Mr. This or Mrs. That or Miss So-and-So. But it was Ian and Julia and, and Fred. You know, that's the way Ford worked. But despite the relaxed management style, there was huge ambition and no room for failure. That's very compact, Keith. What power do you think it'll put out? That sort of Americanism in thinking sat pretty well within Ford because it had grown up that way. It would have been uncomfortable elsewhere. And you've got some real characters, you know, you'd get the guy who'd come over, who was the Texan, who still wore the cowboy boots black underneath his suit and he'd sit there in the office and put his feet up on the desk and you'd see a pair of cowboy boots arrive. Now, I bet that didn't happen in Cowley. Each successive Cortina model proved more popular than the last. Marketing played a vital role in this success and Ford had one of the most imaginative marketing teams in Britain. They used constant media exposure to create a sporty image for their cars. One of the architects of Ford's media campaigns was Barry Reynolds. The public perception of this new range of cars was that all Ford cars are really fast. All Ford cars are really sporty. But also, we recognise that for specific models, the real route to follow to demonstrate its strength and its quality, um, durability, speed, rallying was the route to go. The rallying success of the Lotus Cortina brought a halo to the entire Cortina range. With the Cortina, the time was right to go and do endurance rallying. We went off and we won Safari Rally in East Africa. Touring cars, we went off with the Cortina and, and won various championships around Europe. For Clark, a wet but winning first in class, and his teammates making it a fine two and three as well. The big thing about rallying is that it goes all over the world and you can visibly display your car competing in the snow of Sweden, in the extreme heat of the Acropolis in Greece and in the rough tracks of Argentina or East African safari. 
Images of those cars in those real rare environments says everything. If your car's running there and competing and finishing, it's got to be strong, it's got to be reliable, it's got to be durable. The stylish, sporty Cortina became the car of choice for middle managers and sales reps who in modern Britain were spending much more time driving long distances on business. Many were rewarded with a new Cortina company car each year. Sales rep Derek Forster couldn't believe his luck. He just felt good in the car. Ford had that edge in those days. More people had cars, but they certainly didn't change them every 12 months. So if you're a company car guy uh, and you're in that fortunate position, then you got the look of the neighbours because you had the, the latest Ford model, the latest colour perhaps, and of course a, a new registration uh, to get heads turning. With each promotion, Derek was able to upgrade his model of Cortina until he finally got to the top of the range. He had a regular latest model, latest registration, latest colour, until one of the significant steps I got, I remember well, was the, Ford, the Cortina GT. I mean, uh, that, was, that was, again, a pride and joy era. I had three of those models, a white one, a yellow one, and a, uh, I think it was a, a purple one. Um, which, were, which, you know, they were terrific cars. Ford was now confident enough to make a film that parodied all the old prejudice against them. This is a Ford. Well, what exactly do you mean by bad workmanship? Well, I mean, they're so skinny, aren't they? I mean, look. You know, uh, I mean... See what... You see? You see, and... Uh, that was just with a sledgehammer. Yeah. Ford made their cars even more glamorous by using the American practice of product placement, then perfectly within the law. With the Sweeney, they hit solid gold. I was very conscious that the Ford products had to be shown in a positive light. And I knew that when I put a car with a TV company, I had no control over that. So from the very start, I made up some rules. By supplying free cars, Ford were able to script the car's role. The good guys had to drive the Ford cars and the good-looking girls had to drive the Ford cars. So in one of the most popular cop shows of all time, Ford cast their cars as heroes and rivals as villains. I also used to supply them not just the cars for the specific characters, but there was always a couple of other cars that they, they would have and uh, usually the baddies would drive those. But anybody that watched Sweeney regularly soon got to recognise that whenever the baddies were in an old Mark II Jag, it was going to roll. None of the Fords ever crashed. Television was also creating new motorsports like rallycross racing, and Ford were quick to realise they could use its heroes to promote their cars. Oh, that was great. Hello, Barry. Hello, Peter. They signed up the big rising star, daredevil driver Barry Lee. Barry was every boy racer's dream. Art of throttle control. Very important. Look for the grit, see where it is, and don't accelerate. Don't spin your wheels too quick or too slow, but just look for that grip and feel it. So I always used to race with a hard seat, OK? So I was very good at what we call getting out the box. You can see that Lee has got the latest style of all enveloping crash helmets. When Rally Cross won a regular slot on grandstand, Barry had a bigger stage to play on. Very hard indeed. It was an opportunity he wasn't going to miss. Barry Lee has put up a tremendously fast time. Winning that race. As soon as I'd finished whatever race it is, whatever position I was in, and this is why I think Ford used to love me, I'd get a camera thrust into me, whatever time, because they wanted to hear what I said. Because everybody else would go, oh, well, yeah, I had a good race, but, but I'd say, yeah, I had a fantastic race, but he took, didn't you see him try and take me out, but I won, or whatever. That's the name of the game. In each race, Barry felt duty bound to perform every trick in the stuntman's book. 
Whatever Ford he drove was given instant street cred. He soon became one of motorsport's greatest showmen. I was a showman. I was Leapy Lee. They nicknamed me Leapy Lee because when I used to go over the bumps, my car used to bounce up and down, so they used to call me Lee. So I, I worked on that. I had that. Barry's image was pure rock and roll, and to live up to it, his exhibitionism became even more outrageous. You don't want to make a mug of yourself. So when you're out there, you've put all this flash image on, you know, hey, I'm Barry Lee and I've got everything and tattoos, which I haven't, but I'm only exaggerating there. But I had the gold and, and lame suits. I had the wild crash helmets. I had my long hair, so I looked like a bird half the bloody time. And, but that was the image you had to create. Whether Ford liked that or not, they had to like it because I was winning races. In the late 60s and 70s, Barry Lee became a legend. Each year, he won almost every trophy going in rally cross and hot rod racing. He was the darling of the motor press, always grabbing the headlines and the front covers. But once, even he thought he'd gone too far. And Barry Lee takes the chicken flag and wins in the Ford Escort from Tom Aaron. We put the brand new Escort there. On the, on the green and she comes out and we do a nice little photo shoot. Then they said, look, would you mind taking your gold overalls off and could Nica, Nicola put that, your gold overalls on? So I said, yeah, I don't mind. So, of course, she's at the front of the car and I'm there thinking, will Ford really mind that? So I'm in my Marks and Spencer's underpants, which are the striped ones. So I'm standing there with my legs apart, like shivering like this, right in my underclothes, because the story is she's just nicked my my oval. Well, I didn't realise she's back to me, but on her oval she's got her boobies nearly sticking out. Now, if I'd have known that, I would have died because Ford don't want to be part of that exercise. It not only was wrong, a week later when it arrived in the magazine, I'm thinking, oh, where is it? I missed the front page. It's the front cover of the magazine. There's me standing with me in Marks and Spencer's overalls uh, and, and, it, uh, and uh, this Nicole, the model, like with all the boobs hanging out. But it had fold on it, it had everything else. Is that wrong? Almost all car makers use sexual fantasies to sell their cars, and Ford was no exception. She doesn't care that the seats have been ergonomically designed with extra legroom in the front. She just knows she's comfortable. The idea of women as sexual accessories to their cars was even extended to their star female driver. I don't like to think that Ford hired me for my looks, but I suppose that was part of the deal. She doesn't care that the wider track and new suspension have been designed to improve the handling and reduce vibration. She only knows it's a really smooth, sophisticated ride. I think at the time, I was so enthralled with the fact that I was racing for a massive um, company and being sponsored by them and winning races and enjoying my career. It was amazing. But I didn't realise to the full extent that I was being used, really, as a model. I took my motor racing seriously. Uh, but was asked to do a lot of modelling for different things, different reasons, draped over cars, smiling all the time. And I found it quite difficult because I wasn't a model. Ford were using me uh, as a typical 60s chick, a sex object. Um, I don't like to look at it that way, but... Um, and I didn't think of it at the time because I was so engrossed in succeeding in my motor racing. But I, I think that was the case, that I did attract a lot of publicity. Women were the eye candy used in every new car launch, but their work in actually making the cars was invisible to the outside world. The upholstery of Ford's car interiors, the choice and style of which was always a big selling feature, was largely the work of women. Even though it was a skilled and demanding job, the women were graded as unskilled labor and paid less than men doing similar jobs. Then, in 1968, Dagenham's women workers decided they'd had enough and walked out. We are on strike. All of you? All of us, all the machinists anyway. 
So yes. no car seat covers for Fords? No, not from us anyway. Well, just what are you striking about? Um, grading. At the moment, we're B grade, which is a labourer, and we think we should have C grade, which is um, skilled labour. Ford's women strikers demanded equal rights to men and equal pay. Their campaign gained national prominence and the Dagenham women won huge popular sympathy. They decided to lobby MPs and their cause was taken up by Labour Party Minister Barbara Castle. Together, their campaign helped push through the Equal Pay Act of 1970. It was a historic victory. However, at Ford's Dagenham plant, management still refused to recognise the sewing machinists as skilled workers. But the women's spirit of resistance remained as strong as ever, as Henry Ford Jr. discovered. Henry Ford was coming down to, to visit. He wanted to see what conditions that the machinists worked in. So everything had to be cleared up. You've got to clean this up, clean that up. And so we had a woman sat at the front. We always called her Effie Eileen. And because uh, wherever you went, she was, you, you knew, you went past and you heard it. And uh, so this particular day, as they come in the door, she's on the front machine. So she made herself a hat, and I've got to swear, she put bollocks across the hats, and she just sat there, and the supervision come up, please, please, Eileen, take that hat off. No, I'm not taking it off. She wouldn't take it off, and he had to walk right by. He must have seen it, but no one said, but everyone was in fits of laughter, I reckon Henry Ford thought, whatever's going on in here. <laughs> When Dora became shop steward in 1976, the regrading issue was still on the agenda. Every time payday came round on Thursdays at Dagenham, the women were reminded that the claim for recognition of their skills was still bottom of the agenda. It was a drawn out process. I mean, I think nearly every couple of years on the pay claim, that went in on a pay claim and just thrown straight back out, because it was women. Because I don't care what the men say, even the unions, it was all for the men, it weren't for the women. Dagenham's ultimate dream car was without doubt designed to appeal to men and their sexual fantasies. First launched in 1969, the Ford Capri became one of the most emblematic cars of the 70s. I had been with a vet the first time I saw it. The Capri's advertising slogan was the car you always promised yourself. It was a fastback coupe that looked and drove like a sports car. The baby boomer generation took it to their hearts. From the moment it was launched, it was incredibly successful. It was the first sports coupe and set a new class within the industry. And it appealed to young guys. They loved them. The sexual promise of the Capri drove sales onwards and upwards. By 1973, it had sold a million. The style and speed of the Capri range was constantly enhanced, making it a big seller all over the world. But it was in Britain that its popularity was greatest. And if you were a manager at Ford, Capris came free as one of the perks of the job. I had two exciting cars, and the first was a bog-standard Capri, in metallic bronze with what was called tobacco, i.e. dark brown vinyl roof, and a sort of light beige verging on, on dog poo trim colour. And what I can't get over now is that in 1974, that was fantastic. And, and it's just, you look at it now and you think, who was the man who ordered that car, Ian? And the truth was, at the time, it was great. And you really loved it. This is Ford Capri. As luxurious as a limousine. Powerful as a sports car. The Capri's flash image also appealed to those who couldn't afford the price tag. The car's main target owners were young professionals and the smart new family man who still fancied his chances with the ladies. But subliminal dream images of speed, sex and romance could also prove irresistible to those lower down the social scale, like aspiring Essex boy racer, Dave Harley. 
when the Capri came out, you just looked and you go, my God, that is just, I haven't seen a car like that before. You know, not one that I could afford. I've seen cars that are beautiful in magazines, but they're like, you know, I'm 17. You know, I'm just a kid. I can't afford, you know, even, even if I could, I wouldn't be able to insure it. But they, that was the power with Ford. They would, they would offer a dream that was accessible. When new Capri owners moved up a gear and bought the next model in the range, their second-hand cast-offs allowed a new class of owner onto the road. Waiting in the wings to snap them up were the boy racers. It didn't take long. Once the Capri was two or three years old, the boy racers had their hands on them. You know, and once we got our hands on them, we made the most of them because they were a great, great car. I mean, they didn't just look great, they drove great. And when I got in my Capri, I just felt the bollocks. I just thought, I look, I am a dude in this car. When you got in a Capri, they had a sports feel to them. They had the nice dash, they had the rev counter. Having a rev counter was a big deal because most cars didn't have them then. Uh, they, they, were, they were a car that were built around. You got into it and you went, yeah, I can. this is a car that I've dreamt of owning. It felt like it was my homemade car, you know. That car was made, produced and designed in Dagenham and uh, it was, that was the, you know, the Essex boys' uh, car of choice. But the making of these dream cars was a very different story. In fact, many Capris were not made in Dagenham, but in Germany part of the new merged Ford of Europe. One reason Dagenham lost out was because of its discontented labour force. In 1978, half the men working in the body plant that year got their cards and left. They were casualties of a drive towards greater cost-effectiveness, necessary for survival in the ever more competitive international car market. How many people do you want now for 52? You want another 10 men? Replacements were hard to find. When Keith Dover began work on the Dagenham assembly line in 1978, there was no shortage of vacancies. You'd walk in slow getting into the place to clock on, and then everyone would be the same like that. Oh, you'd get some coffee. So it'd be, everyone would be, be like the living dead, you know, going into work like that. And then at the end of the shift, totally different. Everyone couldn't get out quick enough. Run it down in circles. Whatever, run it. As you've got all this labour on there, just keep running it. If getting a job at Dagenham was relatively easy, keeping it and surviving the stresses and strains of the production line was notoriously difficult. On the assembly line, you had no time at all. You was committed to that job, and, um, and God, it was, man, it was so boring, you know, and you'd do that over and over, the same job, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you'd go in for eight hours, maybe if you're doing overtime, ten hours at the shift, and... You, what you do, little tricks. Oh, like you'd think, oh, uh, I wonder how Arsenal are going to do. And you'd have imaginary, I would have imaginary football matches where I might be playing, winning the FA Cup or designing something in my head. Anything just to get yourself out of it, you know. And you could eventually, once you'd learnt the job, you could do all this and you, your mind could be totally, and you could do it without thinking. But if you were new to that assembly line, man, it, it might look slow, but once you started, it seemed bloody fast because you had to get your bit done before the next guy took over. So he didn't really appreciate it if you weren't finished because if you slowed him down, then he'd be out of sync. More and more black and Asian workers were recruited to work on the assembly line. Shop steward Roger Dillon was surprised how easy it was to get a well-paid job there. He soon found out why. Basically, you were tied to the line. Once that line started, every second was accounted for. If a cycle of one car would be, say, uh, one minute, 20 seconds, you would possibly have um, 10 seconds to pick up a part, 10 seconds to walk to the car, another five seconds to get yourself in position with your, your tools, another five seconds to do whatever, and that would all add up to, you know, maybe one minute, one minute, five seconds. Then the remaining 15 seconds was allowing you to walk back up to the line, back to your station, to pick up your parts to go to do the next car. Many began at Dagenham only intending to stay a short time. Those who stayed on the assembly line too long could be driven crazy by the repetitive tasks they had to perform. 
And there was this guy who was an inspector. Middle-aged, very mild-mannered, intelligent guy. Then all of a sudden, it was like the scene when Basil Fortis attacks his car. He goes berserk and he's got a new rolled up newspaper and he's hitting this engine and he's shouting and he's swearing at it. And I said to the guy I was working next, I said, what's, what's going on there? He said, I'll take a note. He always does that. I mean, what, do you, what do you mean? He said, oh, he just loses his temper sometimes. And I said, but look, he's, he's, he's having a row with the engine. He's actually arguing with it. I said, look, he's hitting it. And, and I, but the rest of the guys were sort of looking at me. He said, well, what's your problem? After Ford's new family car, the Fiesta, rolled off the production line in 1976, everyone joined in with this pantomime performance to promote the image of a happy workforce. Sadly, in the 70s, one day in every four had been lost to strikes and stoppages. The line worker always seemed to be angry about something, and it was because of the nature of the work. People would uh, store up all this anger and then when something went wrong, that was it. They just lost it. And my job, a lot of occasions, would be to, to um, get them to calm down. And what would calm them down is if I actually lost it. If they saw me actually shouting and screaming at the supervisor and them screaming back, it was a bit of theatre. So rather than them do something stupid and them walking out or them, you know, where they could lose their jobs, you'd they were quite happy to see me screaming and shouting at the supervisor. The loss of production due to constant disputes was a nightmare for Ford managers. Some play-acted their way through the minefield of conflicting interests. Sometimes you have to appear pretty damned intractable and say, well, it's thus far and no further. And if that's going to make you guys go home, then recognise that you've gone home for some days or even some weeks, because we ain't going to bend on this one uh, because of its consequences. Uh, and that's the sort of poker bluff, if you like, because you never want anybody to go, and certainly not for weeks. And least of all, because when people do go on strike for a long time, actually getting hold of them to talk them back is an extra problem, because grudges will only have built Ford's tough line on cost control and production targets meant that despite all the stoppages, Dagenham and Ford in Britain remained profitable at a time when the homegrown British car industry was going bust. But in the 70s, Ford's operations in other countries were proving much more cost effective. And the abiding memory of this decade at Dagenham is one of loss and regret. Whenever possible, my middle and last part of the day was simply to walk to the end of whichever process it was and, and look at the cars going up the lift or look at the cars going off the end of the line. Because at least you can see that despite all the frustrations and, and all the tensions of the day, something is still coming out there. There is nothing, well, probably is something sadder, but at the time there didn't seem anything sadder than walking round a giant car plant, you know, which from end to end probably has five days worth of production. So 4,000 vehicles in one state or another not moving. And you know that what should be happening is thousands of people earning their wages, turning those into cars. And when it sits there quiet and empty, because nobody's in at work, and there's, there's those thousands of, you know, on their way to birth cars and nothing happening, that's really very sad indeed. In 1984, the Dagenham dispute that changed women's history finally came to a head. 16 years after the sewing machinists first demanded recognition of their skills in 1968, they again came out on strike. Leading them was Dora Challingsworth. We said, right, OK, the only way we're going to get what we want is to all walk out. So that was it. Everyone went. And I was out for, I think it was about five, six weeks. We bought the place to a close because no one could work without the seat covers. The cars can't go out without seat covers. After rejecting the women's claim, Ford agreed to independent arbitration and the women won their case. We was up in the manager's office this morning. We went up there and sat there till nearly 10 past 10 when the news come through and it was really great. We went down on the floor at quarter past. We had a meeting with the girls at quarter past 10 and there was, oh well, cheers and crying and it was really great. 
it was all there. We knew it was we was going to win in the end. But oh, the day they was told, they just went, oh, absolutely mad, the women. I don't think anyone worked after that. The victory was bittersweet. Ford was one of the world's largest multinationals, and Dagenham had become just one of many plants making cars in different countries. In sales terms, Ford is the third largest company in the world. It employs 480,000 people in over 100 countries and builds over 5 million cars, trucks and tractors every year. By the 80s, the fierce international competition facing Ford was heightened by the huge success of Japanese car makers. Ford responded by shifting production to other European countries, like Spain, where labor was cheaper and costs were lower. Dagenham began shedding thousands of jobs and the foundry started to look vulnerable. We're talking about a, a unique foundry, the biggest foundry in Europe and it had all the required skills under one roof. That in itself made it unique. Such a, a mass of men of wide and varied skills under one roof, it couldn't disappear. In 1985, the foundry closed down. The rationalization of production continued throughout the 80s. The reduction of the workforce was accelerated by the introduction of automation on the assembly line. The writing was on the wall for Dagenham. Dagenham came from an era where they were technologically no longer going to survive and were so riddled with a distrust between management and workforce that you could have written that script, and I think many of us did, years before, and said it's going to end up with this ceasing to happen here. That doesn't mean you're pleased when it does. The fact that you foresee something coming doesn't stop it being regrettable in its own way. The closure of the foundry, once at the heart of the whole plant, was the beginning of the end of car making at Dagenham. For some, it was a welcome relief from drudgery, but a proud tradition of craftsmanship would also be lost forever. Vivid memories remained for Dennis O'Flynn, who went on one last walk round the foundry just before it was demolished in the late 80s. All the extracting units are closed down, the air ducts are finished, everything, it's a dead, dead area. And as I walked around, particularly in uh, the moulding lines and that, I swear I could hear the ghosts of yesterday men. All these blokes that, you know, that I work with who had contributed to the improvement in working and living standards and wages of the Ford Motor Company. I swear, as I walked around there on my own that afternoon, I could hear those voices. The heyday of Dagenham, when it employed over 50,000 and was the largest producer of cars in Britain, is now a distant memory. Car production at Dagenham was closed down in 2002. Today, it still has a workforce of around 2,000, making all the company's diesel engines for Europe. But all Ford cars are now imported. The question begs to be asked, where the hell are we going from here? But I don't think what we'll ever see is the likes of the Ford Motor Company and its magnificent contribution to the national as well as the local economy. I don't think that will ever be equaled again, tragically. The end of the Dagenham dream is part of the bigger story of the decline of car making and manufacturing industry in Britain. Dagenham's finest hour was in the 60s and 70s when it produced the Ford Cortina, one of Britain's most iconic cars. Despite shifting its car production abroad, Ford has remained our most popular brand, a name that will always be fondly remembered for the American-style dream cars, now long gone, that once broke the mold.